to the Fantasy Hockey Podcast. I'm your host, Gamby, with my co-host, Brandon, and today we're talking about the children's. Yep, this is all about children. We're talking about rookies, except for Gusev. Gusev is an and old man. Old. That yeah. shouldn't even be on the list, technically, but here we are. It should definitely not be, but we're keeping it a little bit lax. So this is not necessarily rookies, like, in the literal sense of called or eligible rookies. It's more so in, like, guys that have never really been fantasy relevant and this is kind of their one of their first years in the league, and maybe they played like 10 games before or something like that, and now they're relevant. So we kept it a little bit more lax than most people would in terms of rookies, but I think we still did a good job of not including, like, for example, Robert Thomas, who is very much not a rookie and has played like 70 games. Um, and then the, the first thing we want to mention, so our last episode we talked about like Discord and all, all that kind of good stuff, right? Uh, the one thing to mention this time is we did launch our swag store. Uh, we have toques and scarves in there the scarves have fantasy hockey podcast on one side and on the other side it says you gotta move so if uh bufflin retires i think that becomes a collectible almost immediately <laughs> um <laughs> so be sure to get them uh while they're hot i guess or while bufflin is, is in like if buff retires and line a leaves it's like immediate collectible yeah immediate collectible is a you gotta <laughs> move scarf i mean they don't really exist anywhere else so uh those are on the the shop you can you can find those on our site um the cool thing is patrons will never pay any kind of markup so like if you wanted to buy a toque or a scarf or whatever you can go become a patron for just like one month get an immediate promo code that'll kind of slash the markup off your entire order and if you don't want to do it the next month that's fine or if you just want to become a patron when uh there's there's swag up totally fine with us um but you'll still get that discount either way maybe next se- next next season we'll sell uh wet track suits that evander kane wore Oh my god. Okay, enough of all of that. Uh, Let's start first with the number one rookie name by far, and that is Jack Hughes, who's going at a 126.9 ADP. I have him slated for around 60 to 65 points, about 180 shots, and really kind of no other peripherals. Surprisingly, when I blended all the uh, projections... It's giving me that he's going to get 22 power play points, and I think that's over-indexing. And the reason I think... high. The reason I think that is is because I think, and it seems so far in preseason, that they're trying to keep Hughes and Gusev together. It it seems like they're going to be a pair, uh, both at even strength and on the power play, which kind of makes sense. They've had a ton of chemistry. So that would mean second line, second power play for Jack Hughes and Nikita Gusev. So I wouldn't buy that 22 power play points. And let's say they don't keep Gusev together. Well, then in that case, Gusev goes up to the top power play And then now Simmons probably comes down to the second power play, giving that second power play even less time, which doesn't help Hughes. So I think for Hughes, he's obviously, I I think right now as well, he is the rookie to have. Uh, I I hate to say it. I know I took uh, Kako first overall uh, in our Dynasty League. But right now with the way the lines are set up and how much chemistry Hughes and Gusev have, I've got to say I like Hughes over Kako right now. Only... It might change in a um, in a you know peripherals positions league. league or positions league oh. that may yeah. change things, um, but for the most part, right now, to me, the most exciting rookie has got to be Jack Hughes, especially if that second power play contains both Hughes and Gusev because that chemistry gets to continue. And then Kako, of course, now we know is not going to be on the top line to start the season, and I I expect Booch to have to do a lot to lose it. Um, and so for that reason, I, I gotta say Hughes over Kako. Not to say I don't like Kako, but I think maybe Hughes is entering, um, territory to me where he might be a sleeper. I don't know. Not at that ADP. Because, like, you think about other guys that are down there. Like, that's that's Larkin territory. Trocek's way below there. There's options. Yeah. I wouldn't I call him a sleeper yet. I, there are some leagues and some settings, and of course, you know, check your settings, use our tool, use Colin's rankings or whatever. But there are some leagues where I've seen him be as high as, you know, 70, 60 rank. So in that situation, he may be a little bit of a sleeper. Of course, he's a center, 
It's just something to pay attention to. Um, and then moving yep. on to Gusev on the same team, 168.6 ADP, 100% a sleeper, you know, 60 points ish, yep. maybe a little bit more, uh, 170 shots, second line, second power play, potentially first power play. There's a lot of upside for Gusev. I mean, a ton of upside. Regardless of how you look at Gusev, it's only good. He could yep. have Heeshear on a second line with him. Fine. He could move up to the top line. Okay, Heeshear and Hall. He could be second power play with Hughes. He could be top power play. There's almost no situation in which Gusev doesn't have a good deployment. And for that late, he's almost a last round pick. I feel like everyone should be targeting Gusev as a mark on your sheets, mark where however you're drafting, make sure to have Hughes or Gusev, sorry, watched and at some point take him towards the end. Uh, the next, the next guy we got to talk about here is uh, Merzligans, Elvis Merzligans. I'm trying to say that right. I it don't sounds know like you're saying Liggins. I am Merz, Merzligans. <laughs> that's that's how. So to be fair, we're 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 making an, a concerted effort here to say these names correctly using the NHL guide, which we just found is a thing that exists. That seems to be the way it's spelled, Merzligans, but I don't know. Anyway, he's probably going to split starts with Corpusalo. I. You can't really expect much from either goaltender in Columbus, so that makes him low on my list. He's currently 174.9 ADP. That basically makes him somebody's taking long shots at the end of the draft, and if you're going to draft him, that's the time to do it. He's perfectly fine on the waiver wire, too, to be honest. Uh, next up in Calgary, we've got Dylan Dubé. I think w what you're looking for here is for him to be able to find a way into the top six. Um, there's a couple avenues for that. The first one is the rumors that that Lindholm will not be playing top right wing and we get center time somewhere, which is super bad news for Lindholm if that actually happens. But if that happens, then there's there's the that that top right wing spot open where where Dubé could potentially play. If that doesn't happen, the other way he can get there is if Kachuk doesn't sign by the by the start of the season. Now, I wouldn't read too much into that because you have to assume at some point Kachuk's going to sign. He's not going to hold out for the whole season. So Dubé's like upside is going to be limited because of that. I think that. I would. He's he's not going drafted right now. I think that's the right move. He's a guy to keep your eye on, but he's not a guy to necessarily draft or take early. Yeah, and I think it's worth mentioning that the way we split up this episode is kind of a, a mix. There's a few kind of guys that are going undrafted and aren't going to be that relevant to um, redraft leagues at the top. And then the second half of this episode is more about just dynasty players to watch, very unlikely to actually be relevant in a redraft. So we'll let you know that if you're in a, like a, a shallow redraft league, these are guys you just don't have to pay attention to or you do. We'll make that pretty obvious. And so Dubé, to me, is one of those that deserves to be in this top half just because there is a potential for him to be top line. And if he does, because he's a scoring guy and he's not like a Wilson who's just going to complement that top line, it could be a very big thing for him. He's been playing well in camp for, for yes. what that's worth in yes, preseason. He has. And he's looked like he's meshed pretty well with that top line. Uh, moving on to Winnipeg, Christian Veselainen. He's going undrafted currently on Yahoo. Um, just one of those guys that it's a big name. Everyone talks about a lot. Uh, there's a lot of promise for him. Right now, I have him slated for the third line, though, and just not much fantasy relevance. Uh, but just one of those guys to watch as things evolve, and especially let's see what happens with line A and everything. Uh, that's a way and that Kyle you can Connor see. for that matter. Kyle Connor as well. That's a way you can start to see kind of what's going to happen with Veselainen. I don't expect much from him this year, uh, but he's just a name that everyone talks about. Uh, moving mm -hmm. on to the next one. Let's go to Vancouver with Quinton Hughes. 123.9 ADP. Also, if you did not know, his name is Quinton, not Quinn, but everyone calls him Quinn. And that because his name yeah, is Quentin. Yeah, we just go short. Quentin. Nobody wants to say Quentin. He doesn't want to say Quentin. Oh, I like I like saying Quentin though. So I'm going to say Quentin. So if you met him, you'd say hello, Quentin Hughes. Oh yeah. Just 100%. to be like rude, he'd probably slap you with his stick. I'd be okay with that. <laughs> I treasure. I'd probably get a tattoo of the mark of his stick. <laughs> He's going 123.9 ADP at the moment. Probably like 41 points, uh, 100 100 ish shots. Second pairing top power play. Like I've said before, my expectation with Quinn Hughes, Quentin is that he's probably mm -hmm. going to get offensive sheltered deployment, five on five, and then most of the top power play time. Now, there is a danger with Hughes, I think, in which let's say he starts to falter on that top power play. They have a guy in Alexander Edler that can take over for him, and that scares me a little bit. Um, Hughes is exciting, but as far as a redraft league and standard uh, leagues and everything, he's probably my least one of my least favorite rookie defensemen for the year. And I love yeah. Hughes, but the problem is that he's only offensive. There's no peripherals. And even though he's incredible, that position is slightly perilous simply because there's Edler behind you who can take that spot over in case you falter. And there's no reason to rush him. 
Plus, the, you're looking at a 129 or 123 rather AP, uh, ADP at the moment. There's a lot of like interesting other defensemen going around there. Like oh, yeah. Jacob Truba is right in that area. Uh, you can take another guy we're going to talk about later in uh, in Chronic around there as well. Even later for him. Yep. If you're if you're wanting to gamble on rookie defensemen. Um, and it, w- one thing that I thought was interesting, I was reading an article this morning on the at, at, on the Athletic about um, they basically had beat writers from every single team talk about uh, the team essentially, like a few Q and A questions, and one of them was whose slap shot would you fear the most from your team? And in Vancouver, the guy picked Edler. I kind of didn't realize Edler had a big slap shot. I always know of him as like the drop pass guy, but apparently he's got quite the slapper. So if they decide they need part of that on the power play again, um, that's another avenue you can get in because apparently it's better than Hughes's. Yep. Okay, so next up, Victor Olofsson. He's currently going undrafted. We saw him really break out at the end of last season on that top line. I think that he first of all he didn't make the team this season we don't know that he's going to and if he does we don't know where it'll be now we did see chemistry with him and eichel so that seems like the most likely place for him to go especially considering they've talked about how they want to have reinhardt on his own driving his own line which would bump him down he's been playing with middle stat lately who could certainly use some help um so the the odds I don't, I don't know if you can bet on this or anything right like the odds of him actually making the team but he's a guy to watch i wouldn't draft him but if he makes a team and you see him top line He's probably worth an early waiver wire target. Yeah, he could be. He could. I also think if he does manage to get top line, there's a good chance he gets top power play as well, which is just going to boost his value even further. Yeah, to me, he's similar to Dubé, where it's kind of like a top line or bust. If he doesn't get top yeah. line, it doesn't really matter. But there is. A I think he's more there. likely at the moment uh, yeah. than than Dubé of becoming relevant this season. But we'll see. Um, and then moving into, uh, let's talk about the three Edmonton kind of rookies or potential players that are going to be on the top power play. Uh, so there's Joel Pearson, who's currently going undrafted. Well, all of these are going undrafted on Yahoo, at least. Uh, so there's Joel Pearson, Evan Bouchard, and Ethan Bear. Now, to me, Ethan Bear is the longest shot to make the top power player, sure. make the team in general. Uh, Evan Bouchard has a chance, but the thing for me that is kind of keeping me on the on the fence about recommending Bouchard and even though I know a lot of people you know anytime you talk about um top power play in Edmonton everyone any Edmonton fan every time will bring up Evan Bouchard and I agree I I traded for him in Dynasty I have him I love Bouchard the problem is that if you read everything uh the team has said in the offseason they have been very very adamant that Bouchard will be in the AHL now it's Edmonton they're kind of a dumpster fire and never really stick to what they say so they could just completely turn it on their head and say, you know what? Yeah, we, we need a Bouchard on our team and keep Bouchard up. But if we're going to keep them at face value, what they're saying is that Bouchard will be in the AHL. So he's my second favorite. My absolute favorite for top power play in Edmonton is Joel Pearson. He's looked super good in preseason. Seems to be that kind of missing this piece. This year's Pionk for Gamby, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yeah, this is this is my Pionk for the year. Uh, the question for me on all these guys, Evan Bouchard, Ethan Barrett, Joel Pearson, if any of them make it, and actually get top power play, my big question mark is five-on-five five deployment because there's a very good chance that they could be literally a Pionk where they are third pairing and top power play. So you're looking at virtually no five-on-five five points and only power play points, and that's on a power play that, quite frankly, has not been good for a while. Right. So there's a lot of questions. So, yes, get excited about there potentially being a you know new offensive guy on the top power play for Edmonton. But don't forget about that five on five deployment just because he's on that top power play. Don't get overexcited. So that's the thing to watch. Forget about the power play. I'm watching the power play, obviously. But the most important thing to watch is actually going to be that five on five deployment and where they put him. If he's second pairing and top power play, that's better. If it's third pairing, top power play. I it's questionable on whether he'll be even worth a pickup, to be honest, any of them. Um, but that's kind of my take on the Edmonton rookie situation there. Yeah, the the top power play situation in Edmonton is interesting just in general. I feel like there's five legitimate candidates to play top power play next season. You got Nurse, the three we talked about, and of course, Clefbaum, um, who in that same article, it looks like the beat writers think it's going to be Clefbaum. It seems like the coaches seem to think it's going to be Pearson, at least from what we've seen so far in preseason, but it's uh, it, talk about a moving target on that one. Yeah. And then we should mention, I think nurse is actually probably the farthest one 
from having a chance Maybe. to top power play because I'm, I'm, I don't even I'm just calling him all 20 percent at this point I feel like I've got no idea what's I, going on over there I don't know <laughs> so the thing with nurse and we should mention this because I don't think we've said this on any other podcast but it's really important because I've seen a lot of people throw nurse's name out there as kind of a favorite and that's just not true um the reason that that's not true is that they want to run him as a shutdown d and yep. the coaches said that and normally when you run a guy as a shutdown d you don't run him as a power play guy also and because then you're just eating up so many minutes that it's kind of bad and quite frankly Edmonton doesn't have to do that they don't have to run nurse into the ground as a shutdown d and a power play guy because they've got options they've got Parison, they've got clef bomb sure they're not maybe not fantastic options but it's better than running nurse into the ground and making him inefficient on the other side of the puck uh and so that's that's where i see kind of the whole situation being <clears throat> don't rely on nurse i think as much i, I disagree that it's 20 20 20 all across the board i think there's an edge to bouchard and Parison and clef bomb and then Nurse kind of falls a little bit below all that. Yeah, I'm just saying I have no idea <laughs> is, is the main the main bit. All right, I'm going to jump into a Carolina player here in Martin Nekesh. 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 One of them is right. One of them is close enough. <laughs> I'm not going to say his name anymore. Um, all right, so we don't really know if he's going to make the team yet. However, what we have seen is that they're... They're playing him on the wing, which I think if he has any shot to make the team, it probably needs to be on the wing. I don't think he can do full-time center stuff yet. And, But th that said, if he does play wing, where does he go? Um, we're seeing Dzingel currently sitting top right wing. I personally don't buy that sticking, but whatever. I do think he'll be top six, so it's kind of irrelevant from the point I'm trying to make here. Then you've got uh, Niederreiter, Turbo, and Svechnikov. I, I don't see... Uh, Martin making it into that top six uh, for this season. I, he might play third line, but you know, what is, what is that going to give you really? Yep. We saw Sveshnikov, somebody who I think is way more ready for uh, fantasy relevant NHL time and has kind of the, the pedigree and the, the style to, to be very effective for, from a fantasy perspective. I'm not sure we can see uh, uh, Neches just jump in there like that. Uh, stick into that same kind of vein of a winger that needs really good deployment and most likely won't get it. Uh, how about Vitaly Kravtsov? So most likely it looks like in preseason so far they're pairing him with uh, Leos Anderson. So because he's being pa uh, paired with Anderson, that means he's most likely going to be third line. So it looks like you're looking at a top line of uh, Panarin, Zibanejad, and Buchnevich, and the second line is going to be uh, Kreider and then one of Hedl or Strom or maybe uh, Howden and then Kako on the right wing and then that third line left wing kind of up for grabs depending on what happens with that second center most likely and then you're looking at Anderson and um, Kraftsoff, Kraftsoff on the right wing and so Kraftsoff I think again like I said to me he is a Calder potential player he's looked so good in preseason both at Traverse City and in preseason, he's looked amazing. But the problem is right now, it's just a deployment issue. It's kind of like Zvechnikov. Zvechnikov looks amazing. But from a fantasy perspective, if you don't get that deployment, you just can't be that relevant. And so for me, with him, he is a guy who you immediately put on a watch list and kind of pay attention to in case, let's say, there's an injury in the top six um, or something like that in the Rangers. But Or potentially, let's say, Buchnevich actually falters and the second line is killing it. There's a chance that maybe what they do is they move Buchnevich to the third and then move Kraftsoff up to the top line um, instead of Kako. And maybe they could try to keep that chemistry with that second line with Kako. Who knows, right? But that's the only real situation in which I see Kraftsoff being very relevant. Um, yeah, and I love him. I think he's a fantastic player. I think eventually he will become really fantasy relevant. Uh, but I think for now, it's just not going to happen because I also just don't think there's a spot for him on that top power play. Uh, and because of that, it, it maybe the only way I can see is maybe if they trade Kreider, uh, if when they trade Kreider, then when that happens, maybe that's crafts off it's opening to the top power play. Uh, but at 168.8 ADP, I don't, I wouldn't even take him to be honest. Yeah, that, that was one of the, I was about to say the same thing. I'm like, this is one of those weird scenarios where people are gambling on him late, and usually that's totally fine. But I, I think there's better gambles. I think there's yes. there's higher, not necessarily higher upside, but more, more likely, I guess. Yes, things that can, that are more likely to happen. Uh, do you want to cover the rest of the Rangers while we're at it? <laughs> yeah, why not? Uh, so Igor Shesterkin, uh, goalie, everyone knows him. I think he's a top three goaltender, not in the NHL yet, uh, in terms of actually playing on a team. 
Uh, he's super exciting, has all the talent in the world. He's looked really good in preseason, but kind of one of the issues I've seen with him is uh, it has looked a little fast for him. Um, he's still getting used, I think, to the the, the ice difference, right, and the, the play style difference. Uh, lost sight of the puck a little bit in the, his first preseason game, but did look really, really good. I mean, his athleticism shines through and through, but I think he needs AHL time, and I think the Rangers know that as well. So my expectation is that Igor starts in the AHL for the season, and then either will come up maybe if, you know, Hank gets injured, or maybe will come up if uh, Georgiev gets traded, but it's not guaranteed that Georgiev gets traded yet. Uh, that could happen in the offseason as opposed to at the trade deadline. So that's something to watch for. Uh, but either way, Igor this year I don't think is really fantasy relevant. Maybe someone you want to put on a watch list in case because he has all the talent in the world. Uh, but I don't think this is the year he takes over or split starts or anything like that. Uh, and then the next one, of course, I left him for the end because everyone wants to talk about him, is Capo Caco. Here we uh, go. Yep. Here we go. Going at 108.5 ADP. 55-ish points, 190 shots, top power play, second line. The thing I love about Kako in his first preseason game and, and in Traverse City and uh, the tournament, he looks like he's been on a power play forever. He looks so comfortable on the power play, and I think he's going to be a force to be reckoned with on the power play. Uh, so that second line as well is not bad. I mean, having Kreider, Kreider's a great, great puck mover uh, and so that's good for him too so i think that 55 points is a little bit low from a projection standpoint i think he can do better and i think he has a lot of upside uh and yeah. then the thing i do I wonder what a time they give him that, that's yes. a big question mark with all these rookies it's like how much ice time because that's going to yeah. dictate a lot the thing i do like on the power play is where he's playing he's playing that right slot that, that, that right spot so it's what you're seeing a lot like in the preseason game what you saw a lot and what you saw um kind of in the Traverse City tournament as well, was that the puck actually goes through Kako a lot. So Kako kind of hold it and try to find lanes on that right spot, and maybe he he moves it down below the net, and then it comes back up to him. Then he moves it to Truba, and then it moves to Panarin, um, or Panarin moves it to Truba and then gets back to Kako. And so what I think what will happen is Kako will be involved in a lot of points on the power play, most likely. Um, and, and so I think what I want to see from Kako this year, my expectation is a lot of power play points, a good, healthy amount of power play points, similar to Panarin or Trubas. Uh, and then the, the big question mark will be the even strength. And like you said, how much time does he get? How much does he click with the line? Uh, how does he deal with an 82-game season? That sort of thing. But other than that, I, I think Kako will be just fine. But I think right now with current deployment, um, I think that I would take Hughes over Kako at the moment. Hmm. Interesting. But at the same ADPs, right? Because there's a big ADP gap between the two of them right now. There's a there's a pretty big ADP gap. Kako's, and that's exactly why I think Hughes is a better yeah. value than Kako. Uh, I think, but the thing is too that I mean, you're seeing Kako go, you know, one hundred eight point five on, on ADP, um, and but what you're also seeing is I've seen in a lot of drafts he actually go way way lower than that. So of course, play it by ear, you know, with how your draft is going. Uh, a lot of people will fade rookies to the end in a redraft. And so there's a chance that you could get, you know, Kako. I think if Kako were like a bench player for you, that'd be awesome. I don't know if I'd want him as necessarily a starting lineup guy, um, but as a, as a yep. bench, I'd love it. Moving into Vegas over here, we've got Cody Glass. Now, this is the player that I feel like it, it's, the system's just not going to be fair to him this season as far as like, he's not going to be able to jump Stasny or William Carlson without some sort of injury. Yep. So he's going to be looking at likely third line center time i don't think he's cracking the top power play so he's got all the tools it's just he's on the wrong team for fantasy relevance this season essentially it reminds me a little bit of uh Tolvan in, in nashville like they're a win now yeah. team you, you have to win now you, you just can't yeah. put a rookie into that situation because you don't know what you're gonna but, get but even even more than that it's like he just how could you how could you argue to have him over either one of the other centers right now yep like in in nashville you can kind of say Tolvan could slide in above Craig Smith and like you'd have an argument probably but um I Stasny is I I feel like he doesn't get enough credit Stasny's really good and he's I think he's going to click really well with with Stone I think he's going to be I mean this he's not a rookie obviously but I think he actually might have sneaky upside potential in points he's never a peripheral guy but in points only leagues get, pay attention to him a little bit but because of him Cody Glass gets screwed a little bit so you're going to be looking for an injury to see Cody Glass really be relevant and because of that He's undrafted. He should be undrafted. He's a, a watch candidate for injuries, basically. Yeah. 
Okay, next up is I think this team has some of the most interesting rookies this season just because of they need to to make something happen, and that's going to be Anaheim. They've got three that I think are pretty relevant, and a couple more that are like probably not worth looking at this season, but are like on the cusp. The three that are worth talking about are, first of all, Sam Steele, who I think is probably the most relevant this season. He's likely to get second line. He I don't think he gets top line or anything like that. It's gonna be, he's another guy that's gonna man it's gonna depend on how much ice time he gets to see how relevant he actually becomes in standard leagues. But his, the upside potential is there. It's a matter of what happens on the power part on the power play as well. Although I could see him sneaking into top power play depending on how well he plays. Um, in preseason, he's been playing with Ricky Rax, which is a great left wing if that happens. Otherwise, if Comtois makes it, who's going to be another guy we're going to talk about here, that could be a great left wing for him. On the right wing, he's likely going to wind up with either Troy Terry or Silverberg or somebody like that. So he's going to have a decent right wing as well. I think he's the potential is there for him to have a good season. I don't necessarily think you should draft him because he's somebody you need to watch and make sure he can make things happen. If he's going to give you low shot totals and like mediocre points, then what's the point in, in having him? But he's he's going to be in a top six spot, and that's something you can't say about a lot of the rookies this season. So that alone is going to put him on my radar. Jumping into the next one here, Comtois. He's also going undrafted, undrafted currently. He gets a ton of hits and penalty minutes. So in leagues like that, he gets a little bit of a boost if he does make the team. And if he does make the team, it's, there's a decent chance he will play with Getzlav on the top line or with Sam Steele on the second line. I don't think they're going to play him third or fourth line. I think they'd rather have him in the AHL. So if he makes the team, he becomes much more interesting pretty much immediately, especially in those banger-type leagues. So, again, it's it's hard to tell what's going to happen with him. I wouldn't draft him, but keep, pay attention to him in in uh, in preseason. And if you have a really late draft, you know, you're drafting like October 1st or something, and it looks like he's made the team, and it looks like he's got... Uh, top six deployment, which if he makes a team, I would expect. He's probably worth a late round flyer, especially in pin leagues. And then the last one here is Troy Terry. Um, again, the, the right wing I was forgetting about is Kasha. And Kasha, I think right now, is likely to play top right wing. So that's going to give Silverberg or Terry to second right wing next to Steele. I think Terry, I, I, don't, I don't see how Terry can jump over um, Silverberg. And he can play left wing, so if Comtois doesn't make it, there's potential for him to get top six on the left wing. But uh, I think it's more likely he plays third line right wing, um, which makes him fairly irrelevant, uh, unfortunately. Again, he's another guy. Uh, you can say this about so many players on Anaheim, but the upside is there. It's just probably not this season. Maybe not next either. But uh, yeah, he's, he's a guy, if he winds up getting top six time, he could easily be a streamer option or something and somebody to pay attention to. Yeah, and then going back to Sam Steele real quick, I think the thing with Steele is he's immediately someone to put on watch because I know he wouldn't come out getting top line, but, I mean, you have Getzloff, who's old, uh, gets injured pretty much every season, almost guaranteed at this point, and quite frankly, he's getting older. Like, there is a chance that at some point, and I said this in another, I think in the way-too-early rookies episode or something, I said, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if halfway through the season we see Steele take over Getzloff. Um, I I wouldn't be surprised. Um just because he's getting older and it's time to do the change of guards and whatever, uh, it's start to put steel up there and see what he can do. Um, I don't yeah. completely expect it. And I'll, again, like, you know, or let's say there's an injury, right. And steel is absolutely crushing it up there. When gets comes back, there's a chance that they just stick him on the second line. Of course, the, you that's, know, that's the most likely it. scenario I see is, yeah. um, if there's a gets injury, which fairly likely at this point that if steel is able to take it and run with it, they're going to leave it with him. Yeah. Um, Anaheim, why not, right? Anaheim is the opposite. Um, this is what I love about Anaheim this year is they're the opposite Nashville, right? When we talk about Tolvan and we talk about no opportunities for the rookies, they're the opposite. Um, they are a team where there's so much opportunity, so much movement, and there's so many rookies fighting for spots that it could be anybody. Like, you know, Sam Steele could move up. Troy Terry could move up over Comtois. Comtois could get it. Like, it, There's just so many avenues for these different rookies it's really just a thing of paying attention to them and they're all going undrafted which is awesome at least on yahoo so you can pay attention to them put them on your watch list and just kind of react as the season goes they're they're all in my opinion going to be really interesting flyers or streaming options especially with all the off nights that anaheim has i would think that anaheim has the most calder potential as far as multiple people eligible for it yeah if you sum up the you make an argument for 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 the rangers there but you can't for Jersey because Gusev is not available. So stop it. But yeah, Hughes alone <laughs> is like, yeah, I, I mean, they probably have the best odds, but I think Anaheim has literally the most volume that yeah. could like be in, in contention. 
So let's move into goaltenders. Uh, we have two on our list here that are kind of relevant for this season. I'll take Demko, and I'll let you take your guy. Uh, so Thatcher mm-hmm. Demko on Vancouver. Uh, I have him slated for around 30-ish starts with an okay save percentage and goals against average. I don't really expect much. I also wouldn't be surprised if we see that 30-start mark actually come down to more like 20, um, between 20 and 25, something like that. I, I know they want him to play, uh, but you know Markstrom was so good at the end of last season, it's kind of tough. So... To me, Demko isn't someone that's draftable. I think he is an interesting streaming option at times. I don't expect him, and everything I've read, it doesn't seem like he's going to take over the starting role this year or like that's even a possibility. Um, so I, I'm kind of ignoring Demko almost entirely this year. Yeah. But next year Demko kind of got screwed by Markstrom like breaking out last yeah. season. Like It seemed like it was going to be Demko like having the availability to be starter, like transition into starter last season, and I don't think that's even likely anymore i think if markstrom plays another good season demko is going to be in trouble as far as being able to get starting role it's a net positive for everyone though because the reason markstrom did so well is because of the goaltending coach that came in right um so because they switched over goaltending coaches we've seen just kind of both of them play much better and that's a net positive and this is i think think the last year like but this is Markstrom. what do you want to have happen yeah, but I, I, you think that he's going to resign? I don't think well, so. I don't, I don't know. Maybe not. It's, it's a matter if he does, right? I think they need to. But, I, yeah, I think they need to prep for the change of guards too. Um, well, maybe Mark, Markstrom's not exactly old. So. I mean, either way, I, I don't think this is. I don't think they resign Markstrom. Uh, they're not in like a win now. It only causes j- log jams in your pipeline. Um, but I also don't think they trade him. So, yeah, I think. Yeah, I, I think we're seeing situation. like a, I think we're seeing like a Grubauer situation probably. Um, I would assume Markstrom does not resign. But anyways, Demko this year, not relevant. Okay, go go on to your favorite guy oh, yes. in the entire league. It's time It's time to talk about... Uh, yeah, okay, I'm going to try to say this right this time. Pavel Fransuz. So he's he's going to play back up in, in Colorado. He uh, We've talked about him, or rather I've talked about him, for an endless amount of time. I think I started talking about him in, in last season or this something. This is your Pionk. Is my Pionk, yes. I... If you look at if you go to Elite Prospects and look at uh, Francois' numbers, he has been fantastic in every level for his entire career. He doesn't have a blemish on his record. It's it's really impressive. He played really well, well, reasonably well in the AHL as well. He had an above average save percentage. I think it was something like a nine seventeen last season. He's he's the real deal. He's got a one way contract now, so he's going to be playing in the bigs this season. He's obviously not wa- waiver eligible. So there's going to be none of that stuff going on. Um, I, they've said in the same article I read this morning, good article to read this morning, apparently, they said that uh, they expect Grubauer to, to play between 50 and 55 games, which is going to give uh, Francis somewhere between 27 and 32-ish, which is pretty good numbers. I mean, it's not draftable. It's not. It's somebody more to keep on the watch list, but if he's able to pick those games up that he gets, he might steal a few more, but again, he still probably won't be somebody he'd pick up unless, um, unless Grubauer goes down. But another thing to mention about both Francis and Demko and Chesterkin is they can be really good um, like grabs for uh, back-to-back games. If they have a good matchup and you think or you know that they're they're slated to start that game and you need another goalie start, one of those guys are going to be good options pretty much every single time they're up. So there's there's that. You might not roster them full time, but they can be great for spot starts. Yeah, Francis might be. Francouz uh, might be my favorite streaming goalie of the year. Uh, yeah, of he's up there for me too. He's, he's up there as probably my favorite one. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm a fan of Francouz. I just don't think he's going to start very much. I, I think he belongs undrafted and just be careful of Brandon's hype here. I think he's going to start very few games, but he's a fantastic streaming option that you should I think like 30, 35 is where I would expect him, which is a little higher than they're, than they're projecting. But well, 30 is right in the middle. But uh, I do. I think next season is the season where Fran. I, I'm predicting Francis is going to be a steal next season, a sleeper next season. I actually forgot one on the Rangers, and that's Adam Fox, who's going right now 173.1. And quite frankly, I'm surprised uh, because to me, he should be going undrafted. He has no chance to top power play, no chance to top pairing. He's looked really, really good so far in both the Traverse City tournament and in preseason. But this is not the year. And either way. He'll probably go undrafted or get dropped at some point. So you can place him on watch, but 
Uh, Truba injury, maybe. Maybe Truba injury. I if he guess. does that like head first slide into the boards like his rookie year. Yeah, if he decides to do that again, then I thought all he of died. a sudden. I, I honestly thought he died when that yeah, happened. I was terrified. He would have he would have never been a ranger. Nope. Yeah, he needs to not do that anymore. But Adam Fox to me is just not someone to draft this year. Um he's electric. I know he's an offensive defenseman, and people freak out about offensive defensemen all the time, but he's just not the one. Um if and, and you know, he's going so low that he's just somebody that you can take a flyer on later. There's no need to reach for him. Um, so I would not, I would not worry about it. Um, okay. And then moving on to, uh, moving on to Kale McCarr, another defenseman, another offensive defenseman rookie. He's going at 112.9 ADP. Now he, I like way, way more than Quinton. Um, Quinton doesn't have necessarily the best team around him. Um, isn't as good defensively from what I've read as Kale McCarr. And doesn't get as many peripherals, whereas Kale McCarr has a good shot. He's probably going to get around 150-ish shots, uh, 45-ish points, a lot of that coming on the power play. Uh, he's probably going to be second pairing with Zadorov and top power play. I would expect somewhat sheltered minutes, not super sheltered if he's going to be playing with Zadorov, uh, but top power play for sure, hands down. I think that's a little bit early for Kale McCarr in a standard uh, Yahoo League, mostly because you're looking at guys like Truba going later, uh, and whatnot. So to me, I think the rookie defensemen are being a little hyped a little bit too much in drafts and going a little bit too early, as evidenced, I think, by Fox going at all, because I don't think there's anything really to show that Fox should be going in a standard Yahoo redraft right now. Um, but Kamala Carr in a points league is definitely worth it, I think, as a late round flyer, depending on where he goes. But as far as him going like 10th ish round, 11th round, I don't I think that's way too early for Kel McCarr. And again, not saying he's not good. He's fantastic. Uh, but again, remember too, like from a keeper league standpoint uh, or a dynasty league as well, like know your stats. Uh, because the thing with like the Kel McCars or the Quinton Hughes and that kind of stuff is their peripherals are not great. So if you're thinking of trading for them or you're thinking of making them, you know, like a number one D or something like that, just be very cognizant of, of how the peripherals are going to be affected. Uh, and that's something yep. to, to watch for because that's the big thing is Camel Car and Quinton will not be giving you peripherals at all. Right. I feel like McCarr is one of those guys that I'm I'm hoping I see an opponent draft early. Yes, same. I'm hoping um, someone takes uh, McCarr just so that other defensemen can start to fall. Because like at the moment, yes, he has top power play, but we don't know that that's going to stick. They have Gerard. Yes. If he if he falters, Gerard's going to get a shot. There's yeah. no reason not to give it to him. I mean, uh, I'd, yeah. So he's he's a player. <laughs> okay. Next up, we've got Alexander Texier. I looked this up. So it is Texier. It's not Texier. Oh, Texier. Interesting. Yeah. So at least that's what the end. From now on, if I say anything wrong, blame the NHL. <laughs> <laughs> because it's their their pronunciation sheet. So Alexander Texier, he was projected actually to be to to get a shot at top left wing. So far, we've seen that it seems like Torella wants to go with Felino up there, uh, which geez, but um, he he does have a few other options that he could use. You can wind up with Nyquist. You can wind up with Bjork, Bjorkstrand. You can wind up with um, well Felino, as we already mentioned. But I think that the only reason to be drafting him is if he does make the team and is top left wing, especially if he gets top power play until then I wouldn't be drafting him at all. I would just be looking at him and seeing what happens at the end of preseason. But again, if this is one of those deals where you're, you're drafting the last possible day or whatever, and you get, you get a, a look at everybody who's made the team, he could be worth a late round flyer. But again, he has to actually make it. Next up is a guy I'm actually higher on than his ADP, which I feel like has been unusual so far in this rookie episode. And that's Philip chronic chronic. Yeah, I think that's pretty close. H is in house. Philip Pronick, he's going at 183.4 ADP, which is basically the cutoff of where they stop tracking ADP. That's like the latest late round flyer and in most leagues not drafted. I think Mike Green probably has a shot at top power play, but it could be Tronics. And I think uh, sooner or later, Green will get hurt. So I wouldn't mind taking a late round flyer on Hronik myself. I think that his upside is pretty decent. I don't know that he's going to give you a ton of peripherals, but... I think he's better than like an Adam Fox, for example, and he's going much later. Well, much later, questionable, I guess, but he's he's a late round guy that you can grab literally in the last round, and the upside is there, I think. Okay, so that ends kind of the most relevant players for redraft leagues. Now, this next section 
if you're in a very shallow league and honestly don't care about rookies that you're thinking about in Dynasty or like two years out or anything like that, this is where you stop listening. Um, if you do still care about those guys, there's a there's like maybe three in here that could potentially make the team or at some point come up. But for the most part, these guys are players you want to watch or you're thinking about in Dynasty or Keeper Leagues. Um, even in Keeper Leagues, like you've got to be in very deep Keeper Leagues for this. So just a warning there that we're going to get into some players that you may not even know exist on the universe. So <laughs> so this first one you do know, uh, and that's going to be Bowen Byram, who's going undrafted. Of course, all these guys are going. There's only one guy um, in Eric Brandstrom, which we'll get to, who's going actually drafted at the moment. Uh, but Bowen Byram, not fantasy relevant this year in particular, a fantastic defenseman. But for me, from a keeper and dynasty standpoint, there's a lot of question marks going forward as well. He's like the high skin into Klingberg, in my opinion. But in Colorado, when you look at Dallas, you see that there's Klingberg up top, and then there's Lindell, and then there's Heiskanen. And this is somewhat similar, where you have Kale McCarr is the clear, you know, top power play guy at the moment. And then you've got Gerard, and then you've got Byram. And so, to me, Byram is exciting. I actually don't know if I'd draft him necessarily in a dynasty league, simply because, well, I guess I could trade him later if someone's really you high on him. You would in a dynasty league, just a matter of when. Yeah, it depends on when. Um, but the thing is that, for me, the big question mark with him is how does he get to top power play? Because right now, there is no way. Kale McCarr is better than him. I'm fairly yeah, positive with that. For now. And every scouting report I've read is that Kale McCarr is better than Byram. So I don't see a situation in which Byram gets top power play any, anytime soon. Right. All right, next up over in Chicago, Adam Boquist. I'm actually higher on him than I am on Byram. Yep. He's been playing extremely well in preseason. Uh, we we mentioned that we're a little a little hesitant on Gustafsson, at least I am, in the case that he falters a little bit because I do have Boquist just waiting. So again, he's not a guy to draft because we just don't know yet. But if he gets promoted and and this important and he gets top power play, then he's probably worth a look. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and take Noah Dobson as well. Our next one up, another defenseman. Uh, I he doesn't he probably won't make the team this season, although he's had a, a decent preseason so far. Uh, they, they just don't really need him. If they're going to take him, they need to scratch uh, a roster defenseman, which doesn't seem worth at this point, especially considering they're still developing Devin Tays and Ryan Pollock to some extent. It's more likely he plays another year in the AHL, maybe gets his nine games or whatever, but um, I think we're going to see Devin Tays getting top power play, who isn't somewhat interesting, by the way. But yeah, eventually he's probably going to get uh, the top quarterback position on the power play at some point or share it with Pollock, depending. And then moving into Ottawa. Now, these two guys are names that will be in the NHL, but the problem is that Ottawa as a team is very, very irrelevant. So they deserve to be on the irrelevant section. And the first one is Max Verano. I don't know if I'm saying that right. There was no pronunciation for him. Uh, but I thought it was Verano. It might That's be That's how Verano. I was saying it, but I could be, I don't know. <laughs> one of those two. Uh, 33-ish points, 117 shots, really not much fantasy relevance there and then eric brandstrom is the other one that everyone's hyped on um he looks really good but he's not going to take over chabot it's just not going to happen um chabot you know even now especially now that they've resigned him to that extension that was wholly unnecessary um <laughs> so I, I don't see brandstrom really being fantasy relevant at all this year he's going 172 i like fox more than i like brandstrom to be honest uh, and that says a lot because to me adam fox is really not relevant uh, but Brandstrom probably like around 24 points, uh, 100 is shots this year, but really just not much. I think 24 points may be generous, uh, but that's pretty much it for Ottawa there. All right, I'll take the next couple. We've got Myers and Farabee over in Philadelphia. Myers, the upside is there, but I don't think it's this year. I don't, I'm not sure he's going to make the team. I don't think they need to rush him. So I think he's just going to spend another year in the AHL. And then we've got Farabee, who... Very interestingly, they seem to be, they seem to use him as a piece to get connecting to sign. At least that's, I mean, I'm totally tinfoil hatting over here, but the way they kept hyping up how good he's looked with Giroux and Couturier for the whole time when connecting was not, not having signed yet, it, it just struck me as like, that's what I would do if I was trying to get like twist the dude's arm. So <laughs> I'm under the impression that he was used as a, as like a chip to get connecting signed. And now they don't need any rush to, to bring him to the NHL unless he's totally ready. He may make the team, but he may not. If he does make the team, I don't think he's taking Konechny's role. I don't think he's getting top power play, so I don't think this will be the year for him, even if he does make the team. Yep. Um, I'm also going to jump into the next couple here. 
both from LA, uh, Carl Grundstrom. He's a, a player I actually traded for in Dynasty. I'm pretty excited about him. I don't know if we could if you could talk about him too much in in regular redraft leagues this year, but he uh, throws throws the body a lot. He'll get you a lot of hits. Uh, I think there's potential for him to get top six, but it's certainly not guaranteed. Uh, there's also potential for him to get top power play, but that's definitely not guaranteed. So he's a guy that I would have on my watch list in hits leagues, but odds are you're not going to be able to see much out of him. And then next up, we've got Nikolai, Nikolai Prohorkin, also over there in, in LA. Uh, he's I, I can't see him being fantasy relevant this season. There's a decent amount of, of centers ahead of him in Kempe and Carter. He could potentially jump one or the other. I don't think he'll jump Carter. I think if Carter's healthy, they're going to want him to play. And if Carter gets hurt, I think it's going to be Kempe's to lose at the second second center slot. So Prohorkin, I think, just falls a little bit outside of the radar uh, for, for redraft leagues. Moving over to Florida, uh, Owen Tippett, who's also going undrafted, um, maybe looking at second line time potentially i'm thinking he's more of a second power play third line guy he's really not too relevant unless that five on five line changes there's a spot for him on that second line potentially if he makes the team of course but the problem is i don't see it Uh, i think vetrano is probably a favorite to get that second line but i'm not 100 percent positive i think it's more likely that if owen tippett makes the team he's probably third line and second power play uh, but on that third line, the one question mark I do have there is that uh, they have, what's his name, the Borgstrom as center on the third line. So yep. I don't know if they'd want to have Borgstrom and uh, Tippett on that same line. That's a big question mark. So that's where I'm not sure about Tippett. Uh, so there could yep. be fantasy relevance, but more likely than not, there's not. Uh, Tippett and then, is a shoot first guy, though. So yes. if he ever does make a splash, like he, you can feel fairly confident that he's going to get you some sort of peripherals well that's what makes him kind of interesting if he gets that second line is that i anticipate yeah. that second line to be a scoring line and but so does so does well. uh uh Vitrano. i feel like he's a little undersold himself he gets his shots per 60 are very high he just doesn't get much in the 60 department <laughs> not uh, a lot of time on ice and then going over to arizona is baron hayton probably gets third line if he makes it probably but there's not much relevance there this year i think i like hayton a lot as an option yeah. because uh, it seems to be he's on a path to being on the team sometime this year or next year and he can definitely uh he can make a splash when it comes to um to arizona so i think that he could get there pretty quick yeah so hayton um there's some the only reason i think he may be able to crack second center at some point this season is that uh Schmaltz is terrible at faceoffs. Terrible. So I could see them playing him wing and bringing somebody else to play center. But that's like kind of the only way he makes it up. Um, all right. I'm going to go ahead and take the next one since you can't pronounce this name. <laughs> it's uh, Sasha Chemilevsky. He play- see? <laughs> he plays. <laughs> he plays. He's likely to play. Um, well, he may play second line on the Sharks anyway. Uh, I don't think he gets top power play, but again, we don't really know how the Sharks will use their power play, so it may not matter that much. They may still do 1A, 1B stuff. I don't know that he'll be fantasy relevant. Even if I, I think he's fairly likely to make the team, but he's something you have to watch. You can't take a gamble on him early because it's probably not there. Yeah. Um, There's a spot for him on the yeah. second line. Yeah, there is. There, there is one um, there. Most likely he'll be second power play. And he's really good. Like He looked really, really good in juniors. Uh, the, the question really is whether, whether he'll get that second spot or not. I'll, I'll pair him up with his another teammate of his in uh, since they're so similar, Ivan Chekovic. He also might wind up getting second or third line time. I, he's similar to to Chemilevsky, although I like Chemilevsky a little bit more. How do you uh, say that? As far as potential, <laughs> quickly say it really fast. <laughs> Chemilevsky. I like I like Chemilevsky a little bit more than uh, uh, Chekovic. So, yep. But neither one would I draft, and both of them I pay attention to. Um, okay, then mo- <laughs> moving on to Chicago, uh, Dominic Kubalik. Somewhat excited about him, actually, but top six is a must, and there is a chance. He's looked good in preseason, and in my opinion, I think he needs to go you know, top, top line for it to matter. I don't think there's a spot for him on that second line. And I have seen some rumblings that he could maybe get top line time. So Kubalik is someone to pay attention to. Of course, he's going undrafted. Just pay attention to him. Uh, the next one is a guy that everyone talks about a ton, and that's Philip Zadina. Lots of people saying he won't make it. I buy that. 
I don't think he makes it this year. But if he does, you're probably looking at a top power play guy just because his shot is so lethal. And then most likely second or third line. So I'd say that he reminds me kind of of an Ottawa guy. Um, not a lot of points. Very exciting. But just not a lot of points to be had there. Uh, and I don't really like Detroit's second line that much. Like if you remember last year, anytime someone from the top line moved down to the second line, you almost immediately dropped them every time. Uh, yep. And so that's kind of what I expect from Sedina. I don't think he actually makes the squad this year, so that's a big thing. But there's a potential that he he stays up there. Uh, and then the other guy is Taro Heroes. I think he's who gets the second line and probably second power play as well. But again, another one of those things where it's like you're probably looking at like 35 points. Eh, not really that yeah. relevant. Like in a dynasty, I'm not or, sure he makes it. Yeah, dynasty yeah. or super deep keeper. Sure, he's exciting. But uh, I I don't think so. I think he makes it. I think he's the favorite for that second line. But uh, I don't think he's that relevant even then. Yep. Okay, next up, we'll talk about Dylan Cousins, a new addition. So I don't think he – I honestly don't think he's going to make the team. Um, if he does, he's going to get probably th- – I just don't think he makes it because <laughs> like I, I like Evan Rodriguez. I like Middlestad more than him. Um, they would probably have to move Middlestad down or something for him to be able to make – get a, a decent line it just doesn't seem worth it throw throw cousins in, in the ahl for a year although is he ahl available he might not be he might be one of those guys that can't play in the ahl cousins i can't remember the rules around that i think he can either way i don't think he makes a team uh and then next up ryan polling uh but, but all these guys are going undrafted so there's really no point in talking about it i wouldn't draft any of them uh the thing with polling is it's it's the same deal as uh, it has been in Montreal where there's, it's hard to get top six time. I think it's more likely that if anybody's going to get into the top six this season, it's going to be Kakanami. And then, like, what do you do with a guy like Poling or uh, also Nick Suzuki, another center? There's just there's not enough center spots to go around unless you play them on the wing, which I don't really see happening. I think Poling's going to be amazing when he actually does make it, though. Uh, and then also, probably should have paired him with Barrett Hayton, but we've, we should talk about Nick Merkley. These, the, the next few guys are really quick because there's not a lot to say nick merkley unlikely to make it could play center but baird hayton's above him could play wing but they may not need him and then i'll also take the next one here and oliver shillington uh we got it right this time i did i remembered the only reason he'd be relevant is if he makes it he jumped valamaki because valamaki got hurt so now we've probably got shillington is next in line he would have to make top power play which there's a lot of people in front of him you got Rasmus Anderson you got TJ Brody you've got Noah Hannafin who all could take that spot if Giordano gets injured so he's a real stretch but it's a possibility if he does make it uh and then for me I'm going to take uh, Kirby Doc who's in uh, Chicago another one that was just kind of drafted very good player not going to make it this year um and there's Emil Bebstrom from uh from Columbus He's probably going to yep. make the team, most likely, but most likely you're looking at more of a kind of shutdown role, third line, you know, limited minutes, just not a lot of space to work with for Bemstrom. He's incredible. I think there is maybe some outside shot he gets that top left wing spot, but I doubt it. I, I really, really don't see it. I think he's more of a bottom six guy for this for this year at least, um, and everyone knows just how offensive he is, but for now, we probably won't see that. Um, and then, of course, there's Eli Tolvanen, Tolvanen, not going to make it this year, most likely. Um, there's a spot for him at some point, potentially. But for now, I would say that it, it, it's not going to happen. And then there's Drake Batherson in in Ottawa. Ha, he, he's up there. He's going to do things. I don't think he's fancy I, I relevant, I think he might, he might be interesting if he gets top, top right wing, which is yes. possible. Possible. Ottawa's like, who knows what's going to happen over there. Could yeah. be anybody. Uh, another rookie over in Nashville would be Dante Fabro. He looks like he's going to get second power play, but it just doesn't matter. The second power play is such a fall off from the first one now that uh, he he just, there's no reason to draft him. You could keep an eye on him, but like the only way he'd actually get relevant time is a Yossi injury and probably an Eckholm injury and probably a Ryan Ellison. So no, <laughs> I don't think you really need to worry about him too much for redraft leagues. Uh, next up, Samuel Montembeau. He is a goaltender over in Florida. He is going to be the backup the only way he's going to be relevant is if Bob gets hurt. He could be okay for some spot starts no. on favorable matchups. He's an but awful. It'd have to be a favorable matchup. He's an awful goaltender. Don't pick yeah, up. Don't favorable pick matchups up. though. He's, he's awful. <laughs> Boy, you hate you hate him. He's he's not good. He's he's straight up a bad goaltender. <laughs> <laughs> well, Full next stop. up, I, I, 
I'll mention one more player here, uh, Nico Sturm. Now, Miko Koivu is the second center in Minnesota, and the, I think that Sturm could possibly take that at some point if Koivu gets hurt, which he does a lot. Um, he would wind up with probably okay wingers. He might get Parise or something. He shoots a lot, uh, which is nice, but he's, again, not worth drafting or anything. He's a guy you can keep your eye on. I, I'm sure I'm higher on him than a lot of everybody else. Sturm? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> but, uh, I, yeah, I'm sure I'm a little higher on him than a lot of other people are, but he, I think I, I have him in my Dynasty League. I'm hoping for something. I, I like shoot-first guys, and he's a shoot-first guy. I just want to say that, uh, to me, Montembeau is uh, his equivalent is Garrett Sparks, and Garrett Sparks is bad. Wow. Yeah, that that's my painful. Him. Yeah, not a big fan of him. Uh, okay, and then there's two more: uh, Jordan Cairo, cool, probably bottom six, maybe some top six time on the second line, but just not a lot of fan, not a lot of points. I think he, he could get second. He can get second line time with eh, if he with makes O'Reilly. it. But he, it's it's between him and Robert Thomas. Yeah, and I, I Robert Thomas has the pedigree. He's and played. He's, I, I, I don't possibly see him. hurt. Yeah, I don't see him. He hasn't played preseason yet. Robert Thomas, if once Robert Thomas is back, uh, and then the very last one is Leaf Ilya Mishev. He's going to be fine. He's on Toronto, which means you know everyone rushes and gets excited about Mishev. But I just don't think this is the year for him. I think in Dynasty, he's a really interesting pickup. Um, I don't think there's any room for him in that top six. I think he's a third line guy, uh, potentially second power play. Really, you're looking at a guy, again, you know, third line, second power play situation that's not that exciting. Uh, in a dynasty, I'd probably eye him and make sure that he's kind of grabbed if you're in a deep dynasty with minors. But aside from that, he's really not not that worth it. Well, there you go. That's all the children. We talked about all the children this time. There's so many names, and I, we might have still missed some, but, you know, the, the fantasy relevant ones are towards the top. Yeah. And even then, if I we think... Didn't, if we didn't mention your player, he either wasn't relevant at the time of this, or he won't be relevant anyway. <laughs> For redraft leagues. <laughs> yes. And if there is one that you think might be relevant or you're thinking of taking or it's Dynasty or whatever, feel free to tweet us at Fantasy Hockey PD or ask us in Discord. Um, other than that, yeah, we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Fantasy Hockey Podcast brought to you by myself and my co-host, Brandon Stockenborg. If you liked this episode or others, please leave us a review. It's the number one way to help the podcast. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at Fantasy Hockey PD. Join our Fantasy Hockey Discord channel. Play in a listener league with us by becoming a patron and check out all our tools on FantasyHockeyPodcast.com. All research courtesy of Dauber, Daily Faceoff, Hockey Reference, Hockey Viz, Natural Stat Trick, Evolving Hockey, and Rotowire. Intro song is by Avicii, and the outro is by Deadmau5. Thanks again for listening, and we'll catch you next time.